Good morning, everybody. Welcome to church this morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord. Again, what a privilege that we have to go before the throne, to go into his presence. Would you stand with us as we give him all the glory this morning, as we worship him this morning? Let's just ask him to turn our hearts towards him. God, we are so grateful and we're so thankful that you call us into your presence, that you call us home. Father, that you, you call us to be your sons and your daughters. We want to give you the glory this morning, Lord, as we worship you in song, Father. Would you speak to us? God, would you be lifted high in our hearts, Lord? Even when we don't feel it, we want to choose to lift you high. And God, when we feel it, we choose still to lift you high because you are the only thing that is worthy. Would you fix our eyes on you? Would you remind us of who you are? Would you be honored by what we put before your throne this morning? It is only to you that we worship, Lord. You and you alone, for there is no other name by which we can be saved but you. God, you are so good. Come in this place. We thank you that you're here. And we thank you that you call us your own. Over me, 
give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath.
from you, all is for you, all is sustained by you. You are worthy, you are worthy. We give you all the praise, all the honor, the glory today. Amen. 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 Can I have a seat? Thanks for singing with us. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to church this morning, whether you are here in person or you're joining us online. If you are new here or you're visiting, we are Center Point Church, and we're about making disciples where Christ is the center. And so before we get to the rest of the service, I got a few quick announcements for you. Uh, first off, if you are new here, we'd love to connect with you. Uh, you may notice on the back of your seats, there's those QR codes there. Uh, those help you to fill out our online connect card so that we can connect with you. But if you want to know more of what's going on around the church, or if you've been at the church for a while and want to know what's going on and get notifications about things, we also have our Centerpoint Church app uh, where you can view events, you can do uh, donations through there, forms that need to be filled out, all those sorts of things on there. And upcoming on the 25th of April, we have our AGM. Uh, so we'd love to have you all out for that if you want to hear about how the different ministries in the church are doing, how the finances are going, or uh, we're also taking that time as uh, corporate prayer just so that we can pray together as a congregation over the ministries and the volunteers uh, and just everything that's going on within the church. And then lastly, we've got ways to give. Uh, if you would like to donate to the church, we've got a few different avenues. You can do so online through our website. Uh, we can also do uh, e-transfer to kyla at centerpointwinnipeg.ca, or you can do so through our app. And then we also do the old-fashioned cash and envelope, if you'd prefer that method. Uh, now I'm going to call up all the kids for CPK. We're going to pray for your time downstairs, and we're going to pray for the offering as well. How are you guys doing today? Good? You guys excited to be back in school? No. Oh, man. I love school so much, guys. Yeah? You love school? What's your favorite subject? Uh, okay, fair enough. History is one of them. Okay, I like history too, particularly when it comes to the Bible. But uh, let's pray for your time downstairs and for the offering, and then we will hand it over to Pastor Glenn. So, Father, we thank you for this morning and the time that we can spend together worshiping you. We just pray that you would bless our time downstairs in CPK, that we would be able to learn lots about you, have fun, and uh, just build good relationships with each other. We also pray for the offering as it comes in, that you would help us as a church uh, know where to place that money to effectively further your kingdom and just give back to you. Lord, we pray over Pastor Glenn as he gives the message here this morning, uh, that you would just speak through him. And Lord, we just pray that you bless the rest of the service and our uh, time together. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Oh, you can grab, you can grab me. All right, well, we, uh, before we have our message uh, and the awesome bumper video, we are going to ask the lights to come on first. That would be awesome. All right, there we go. All right. So first things first. So the light's coming on first. So we, um, as a church, have the privilege and the opportunity to bring uh, people through uh, the Connect card, right? You see that? And then you find out more about the church. Some people come involved and get serving. Many of you are doing that. We're super excited to see our church growing that way. And uh, then some are interested in knowing what's going on in our church, and they want to know more about the church. So we have membership classes. And... We have um, a new members, uh, members candidate, family, that's uh, uh, gone through that. And I want to ask um, uh, OK and IJ to come on up. So you two, uh, we uh, are so thankful to see this uh, young family. Timothy's already gone down to Centerpoint Kids, their young boy that they have together. And um, this family has been attending our church for several months. OK has been coming for uh, since September, correct? Is that right? Yeah. 
All right, very good. And IJ has been coming since about January, right? Because they were, um, because of work, they were apart. Because you came to Winnipeg, you're working in the city here now, and you had to kind of get all things transferred over, and now they're settled here, and you guys got a place to live, and you guys are all together, which is great to see the family. So uh, it's been great to get to know both of these, uh, these two. Um, um, I just been part of the ladies' Bible study. I've been coming out. My wife's been uh, telling me how great the study has been. It's been really exciting to see you. And OK has been coming to the men's study. And it's great to see your contribution. So uh, these two um, have been um, a part of our church for not as long as some others, but they want to get involved. And so I'm not going to put you guys on the spot or anything. I'm not going to ask you any questions. I'm just going to say, welcome here. I'm going to ask Jerry, our chairman of the board, to come up. And he wants to pray um, for you, over you guys. Um, it's a privilege of ours to be able to bring people through membership. And so um, you can see, as soon as I said, I'm not going to ask you any questions, how they just went, oh, that's good. So Jerry, if you would maybe come over and maybe go to this, that side, take this mic. And um, you can pray over this couple, and then we as a church family can welcome them into membership. So let's do that. Father God, uh, we just come before you, and we just give you thanks for OK and IJ, just that they want to take that step, that step of becoming disciples where you are the center. Lord, this is all about you. We talk so many times about us being a salvage ship where everyone gives and everyone works. And I just thank you that these two are stepping forward and are able to take on different roles. I just ask that you bless them tangibly as they bring up their son, Timothy. And Lord, just be with them today. In your son's precious name, amen. Amen. Great. Thank you. Give me a hug there. Come on, buddy. <laughs> Love you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Give him a hand. How many of you uh, can name more than uh, t five kings of Israel that were just unreservedly good guys? Anybody? Okay, what if I narrow it down to three that were just like really great guys, top notch, didn't do anything that was really that wrong? Yeah. Who? David. David, except for the fact that whole Uriah Bathsheba thing, right? He was a man after God's own heart, though. That was a good answer. But at the same time, we get the real story. One of the things I love about the Bible is I love the fact that we're dealing with real people. And as we know, people are messy. People make mistakes, and some people really make mistakes. But what God does is God redeems us in the middle of our mistakes. And God even works with sinful humanity to accomplish some of the most amazing things that you can imagine. And so the story of the Bible, and we're not going to go through all the kings, but we're going to spend the month of April talking about some of the bad ones, some of the bad kings. We're going to say, why did God have us record or have those kings' uh, lives recorded? And the reason is because there's some lessons that we can learn. So I've entitled this series over the next month, Good Lessons from Bad Kings. Now, do we have any bad kings in the world today? <laughs> do we? Maybe just a couple. Okay, we're not going to get started on that, because that can get us on a whole other train, right? A whole other rabbit trail. However, there are a lot of kings who made a lot of significant mistakes. And I want to start out with the very first king of Israel, a man by the name of Saul. So if you'd open your Bibles, we're going to do a little bit of hopping through the book of 1 Samuel this morning. I want you to go to 1 Samuel chapter 9. 1 Samuel chapter 9. And we're going to talk about a king who, 
it was, was all um, bluster, and he had so many gifts. He was revered by the people, at least to start. If you talked about his popularity or his approval rating, it would have been pretty high to begin with. But even though there was much that he did that was courageous, he also suffered from a lack of faith and cowardice. And that's the title that I have for the message this morning, is Courage and Cowardice. So let's pick it up in 1 Samuel chapter... Um, actually, let's go back to chapter 8. And I want to just pick up the last three verses of that chapter. Now remember, what's happened here is Samuel is a judge. And judges were men, and uh, sometimes, like with Deborah, lady of God, who were involved in being God's um, special vehicle to judge the nation of Israel, to make sure that the laws of God were being obeyed to make sure that justice was prevailing in the land. And God used some of these judges, and they weren't perfect either, Samson being the best example probably of that, but he used these judges to accomplish victory over Israel's enemies, redemption or salvation from some of their current states that they were in, and certainly to explain to them God's law and word, at least for those that were faithful, and the best of them was Samuel. However, even though Samuel was an amazing judge, he wasn't a great dad. And his two boys were not following in dad's footsteps. And the Israelites got a little bit sick and tired of this. And they looked at what the nations around them were doing. And there was actually a bigger picture as to why they would ask for this than just the fact that Samuel's boys weren't doing what they should have been doing. But they were in a political and a, maybe a military and a, and a cultural milieu where everybody around them had kings and they didn't. And they decided, we want a king for ourselves. Samuel was upset, and God said, this isn't good. And Samuel gave them a warning and said, if you choose a king, he's going to do these things to you. It's not going to be as good as you think it's going to be. And then we read at the very end of 1 Samuel chapter 8, these words, verses 19 to verse 21. But the people refused to listen to Samuel's warning. Even so, we still want a king. Does that make sense? People would ever say something like that. Even though we know it's a bad idea, we still want to do it anyways. Do we ever do that in a democracy? Oh, yeah, we do it all the time. I'll lead it, just let you know, it's nothing new under the sun. We want to be like the nations around us. Our king will judge us and lead us into battle. So Samuel repeated uh, to the Lord what the people had said, and the Lord replied... Do as they say and give them a king. And then Samuel agreed and sent the people home. Now, let's pick it up in chapter 9, verse 1. So who do they pick? There was a wealthy, influential man named Kish from the tribe of Benjamin. And he was the son of Abiel, son of Zoar, the son of Becherath, the son of Hephiah, of the tribe of Benjamin. And his son Saul was the most handsome man in Israel, head and shoulders taller than everyone else in the land. So they picked who? Somebody from the wealthiest family, the handsomest person, and the tallest. Did a little study in the United States of America and in Canada and found out that the leaders we choose tend to be taller than the average man. Did you know that? Does that surprise you? That their average height is probably about two or three to four inches taller. Like, they're not my height. I'm an average-sized guy, and unfortunately shrinking as I get older. I was average height when I was 20. Maybe I'm a little bit below average height now. I think I've lost about three-quarters of an inch or half an inch. But nothing to look at on camera, but man, people like to pick. Man, I mean, even in our own country, what, what, what's been the choices? I mean, you look at our prime ministers. How tall is our current prime minister? He's six foot two. I'd be short compared to Mr. Trudeau. I would be. And his predecessor, and his predecessor, and so on and so forth. And never mind talking about what happens in other parts of the world. So, there was this person who was well-known, this person who came from a good family, this person who could, in today's money, probably could raise lots of funds, right? Had good connections and was photogenic. 
but it relied on his ability. And the problem with Saul was that while he seemed to be a man who was um, gifted, he relied on his own ability, and it led to him being a person that wasn't courageous at times. He was a coward. And that's the first truth that I see in this passage, is that cowardice relies on our own ability. That's what it does. Now, it's not that our abilities don't matter and that we shouldn't use them for God's glory, because they, they are good things. I mean, it's, it's wonderful that Saul came from, a, from a, a wealthy family, could have used that for God's glory, but it appears that he was resting on something else. Let's look at those two verses again. Just put them up on the screen. I'm not going to read them all, but look at the two first descriptors of his dad. There was a wealthy, influential man, and it was his dad. His name is Kish. Wealthy and influential. Those two go together. Who are the most influential people in our world today? Do they tend to be wealthy? How many of you know the names of the wealthiest people on earth? Name me one of the wealthiest people on earth. It's pretty famous. Jeff Bezos, money. They can't buy any more stuff. What do you then decide that you want to do with your wealth? You want to be influential. You want to be able to exercise power, right? And so these people can do that. I mean, there are some people whose influence outstrips, it seems, at least from a worldly perspective, um, an entire neighborhood of people, maybe even an entire small town. And not only was this person influential, he had a really good-looking boy. And he was taller than everybody else in the land. He was tall and dark and handsome. Are we any different today, though? Before we criticize the Israelites, are we any different today? We say, as a population, that we are very discerning when it comes to choosing our political leadership. Right? We do. If you talk to the average person on the street and say, do you just pick a person because of the way they look? Do you just pick a person because of, you know, some um, ability in front of the camera? They say, oh, no, no, not me. Not me. I remember there was an election that happened in one of our bigger cities. It was in Canada. Calgary, actually. And there was a mayor who kind of broke the mold. His name was Nenshi. You're going to in the middle of the mayor, Nenshi. So he, he's a visible minority person, and um, he, he was the first in that city to have uh, some of the parameters that would meet his, um, you know, being a person of a minority, right? A, a visible minority. He said, well, how did this guy get to be the mayor of Calgary? And, and what happened was, he started to run, and, and what the people that were his political advisors noticed was that... Um, Nobody paid attention to something. So he put out a website, and it had his platform. And they do, actually, here's what they did. They tested out how long people that click on the website stay on different areas. So they click platform, and here's where I stand for and why, why you need to vote for me. Guess what the average time that people spent on his platform side of his website was? I'm going to take a guess. Three seconds. See, five seconds, that's way too long. Okay. Three seconds. You know what they realized? Nobody's paying. Everybody talks a good game, but nobody actually pays attention. So then they said, just put him in places where he's around cool people. And then put him in places where he's around smart people. And put him in places where he's noticed. And he's around people that other people think are really great. And then before you know it, people say, who's Nenshi? He's cool. Who's Nenshi? Smart. Who's Nenshi? I'm a good person because I'm going to vote for somebody that everybody else wants to vote for. And before you know it, he's swept into power. Do we ever do that in our national elections? Thank goodness we don't do that, right? But Samuel, he, he knew. And Saul wasn't the guy. Now, what ends up happening Saul anoints, Samuel anoints Saul as king in chapter 10. And then he's acclaimed as king in the latter part of the chapter. So they're all ready to recognize him as their king. But then we pick it up in chapter 10. I want you to zip along with me to chapter 10. And they're looking for Saul. Now he's been acclaimed king, he's been anointed king. He's been given the responsibility to be the king. 
And it says this, then he brought, in verse 21, then he brought each family of the tribe of Benjamin, because that's where tribe Saul was from, before the Lord and the family of the Matarites was, the Matarites was chosen. And finally, Saul, the son of of Kish was chosen from among them. So they did this lots. They were choosing from the Lord. The, the Lord was overseeing this. But when they looked for him, he had disappeared. So they asked the Lord, where is he? And the Lord replied, um, he's hiding amongst the baggage. So they found him and brought him out, and he stood head and shoulders above anybody else. And then Samuel said to all the people, This is the man the Lord has chosen as your king. No one in Israel is like him. No kidding. Look at how impressive he looks. Look at how amazing he is. Look at where he's hiding behind the baggage. What was his character like? He was relying on his own ability? It doesn't work. What about you and I? What about our own ability? Isaiah chapter 40, verses 29 to 31, says he gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired, and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. He gives strength to the what? The weak and the powerless. Not the wealthy and the influential. God's not against wealth, but he's against us trusting in our wealth. God's not against having physical ability or intellect or any other gifting. He's the one that gives those gifts to us, but he is against us relying on those things. And relying on our own ability will always get us in trouble. There's nothing like getting older to remind you of the frailty of life, right? Right? And when you're young, you don't think about it. When you get older, you realize some of these things to be true. And you think you're brave. It rests, though, on your own ability. There are bigger fights. There are harder opponents than you can handle on your own strength. I don't care how strong you are. I don't care how powerful you are. I don't care how gifted you are. You are not up for all of life's challenges on your own. You need someone greater. You need someone bigger than you. You need someone more than you can muster on your own strength. It's hard when we're young. It's hard when we're gifted. It's hard when we're wealthy. It's hard when we're influential to recognize these things. But Saul is an example of this. So he already showed some cowardice at the beginning. But he didn't do everything wrong. No. He also did some very good things. Matter of fact, he was quite courageous um, in the next chapter. And you know, when he finally leaned into the fact that God made him the king and he had God's authority with him, he proved to be courageous. And, and that's when we look at cowardice and then we look at courage. We see that, yes, cowardice rests in our own ability, but courage rests in God's authority. Who made Saul king? Not the people. The Lord made him king, correct? Correct. And who sets authority in place today? We think we do. The Bible, Romans tells us pretty clearly, God's the one who sets authority in place. We often forget that Saul actually did some things right. Early in his kingship, he was very courageous. He was successful as a leader, as a military leader. In spite of his initial cowardice, the Lord sent his spirit upon Saul, and he was able to fight against a much more powerful enemy, the Philistines. And the Philistines appear to be pretty surprised at this newly minted king of Israel. And this was a man who had more success against them than anyone in a long time. Let's look at, look at 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 2 to 4. So flip along with your Bibles, and I got it on the overhead if you want to follow along with me. Saul selected 3,000 special troops from the army of Israel and sent them, the rest of the men home. And he took 2,000 of the chosen men from him to Michmash and the hill country of Bethel. And the other 1,000, the Bible says, he said, went with Saul's son, Jonathan, to Gibeon, the land of Benjamin. And soon after this, Jonathan attacked and defeated the garrison of the Philistines at Geba. And news spread quickly amongst the Philistines. So Saul blew the ram's horn through the land. 
saying, Hebrews, hear this, rise up and revolt. And all Israel heard the news that Saul had destroyed the Philistine garrison at Geba and that the Philistines now hated the Israelites more than ever. So the entire Israelite army was summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. Who were the Philistines? Powerful group. Can I have somebody give me a bottle of water, please? I'm going to need one. Thank you. They were a warlike nation. They were in competition with the Phoenicians, the Egyptians. They were two major powers of the southeastern Mediterranean at the time. And I want to show this next slide. Thank you. You may not be able to see it super well. Sorry, it's, oh, there it goes, it's up on the big screen. So they captured Geba, and it's kind of central. Where do the Philistines come from? What, what side of the land? Towards the east or the west? Towards the west, towards the ocean. But they've been making headway in. And what do we see here? we see that Israel has now poked the hornet's nest. And these Israelites were like, the, the, the Philistines, did they have any giants? Were they big and important? You may ask the question, would you, what would you do? against an enemy that's technologically superior to you? What'd you do? Israel needed to resist, but in the power of what? The Lord. Does anyone know James 4, 7? Does anyone want to help me with that? Resist the devil, and he will what? Flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. When I look at this passage of scripture, I realize that I'm not strong enough. And, you know, I'm going to share something with you. You may be wondering, what on earth is going on with him right now? Glenn, do I, do I appear to be a strong person in personality to you sometimes? Like, what is my personality? like to you. Sometimes it can come across as being strong, right? And I've had a struggle in the last decade, decade and a half, where I have anxiety sometimes. And it's never hit me in public very often. But a few years ago, it did once when I was preaching, and everybody thought I was having a heart attack. How many of you were here when that happened? So just a few of you. Most of the rest of you weren't. And I usually carry with me a little magic pill that helps me if I ever get a panic attack on the way. And it kind of gives me a sense of like I'm feeling like I'm going to be okay. It's called carnazepam. And, I, and, and, and I've tried to shake it a few times and it hasn't worked. But God still used me in the middle of it all. In the middle of the pulpit, my greatest fear is that it hits me when I'm in the middle of preaching. And something happened this morning as I was preparing for this message on courage and cowardice. I realized I made a mistake. And I, I could go weeks or even months without using the little pill. And I looked in my wallet and I'm like, I don't have it. And so here I am looking at you. Most like pull my wallet out. I'm like, do I have that? I don't think I have it. I don't have it. And I'm like, and then it starts to build. And it's, even as I'm preaching to you, the anxiety is hitting me right now. And I'm like, okay, 
Don't have a panic attack in front of everybody, especially when you're online and you're in front of everybody here. I am not the most courageous person out there by any stretch, but I thought when I started pastoring 25 years ago, I was pretty courageous. I thought I was pretty strong. I thought I could handle all the challenges of life. I thought I was a 500 horsepower engine. And then life hit me. And then I realized I wasn't as strong. And I don't know why it's hitting me right now while I'm preaching this message, but I'll bet you it's because God's trying to use it as some kind of example. And I, I apologize for it being that way, but my strength can't be in my own ability. Whether I got 2,000 men like Saul did or 1,000 men like Jonathan, whether I took the fortress of Geba, I have to rely on God. And, I, and, I, and, and the thing I have to realize is I have to rely on him daily. I have to rely on him every week. And that's why I appreciate your prayers for, for all of us, of course, but for me too when I preach on Sunday morning. Because at the end of the day, I'm not strong, I'm weak. Isaiah chapter 40 has become more real to me as I've had to deal with some of these issues over my adult life, things that I would have preferred not to ever have walked through. And you know, one of the problems that I had when I was younger is I didn't have a lot of empathy or sympathy for people who had problems like this. I remember hearing about these things and going, what's the matter with that person? Like, how come they can't figure this out? And then it was my turn. How many of you have ever been there? You've been there? So I really appreciate you guys' prayer for me. By the way, I'm starting to get my mojo back so you can feel like I'm going to finish the message. What about cowardice? Cowardice that we all struggle with rationalizes something. It rationalizes partial obedience to God. It does. You know, how many of us have ever obeyed God only partly? Raise your hands. How many of you ever thought, oh, that should be good enough? Now that the Israelites declare war on the Philistines, they could expect a massive response. Look at verses 5 to 7 of chapter 13. The Philistines mustered a mighty army of 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and as many warriors as the grains of sand on the seashore. What did Israel do? They went and hid. Israel had 3,000 men. The Philistines had 6,000 charioteers. Like, it's like going into battle today and saying, we got 3,000 soldiers on the field. And like, yeah, we have 3,000 tanks. One man per tank? That doesn't seem like a very good, that's not good, right? And as many men as sand on the seashore... You know, these Philistines, they got into some rows with their neighbors. They would fight the Phoenicians and the Egyptians. Way bigger armies than the Israelites had. The Israelites are just a farming people. They had the mastery over their um, smithing iron. Technologically, they were way more advanced, bigger people. So Saul is thinking, like, oh, wow, like, what do I do here? Then, then, then he's like, well, we need, to, we need to sacrifice to the Lord. See, he does what looks at least at first to be the right thing. And I want to pick it up in verse 7 to 9. Let's take a look at this. Meanwhile, it says, Saul stayed at Gilgal, and his men were trembling with fear. No kidding. Would you be trembling with fear? I would be. Saul waited there seven days for Samuel, and Samuel instructed him earlier. He's like, okay, well, let's wait a week. But Samuel didn't come. Saul realized his troops were rapidly slipping away, so he demanded, bring me the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And Saul sacrificed the burnt offering himself. What's the big deal? Can't offer the sacrifice if you're not a what? A priest. It's a huge deal. Saul's thinking in his own mind, but this doesn't make any sense. Why would God have his man make me wait? The enemy's coming. My soldiers are slipping away. And so he made a decision. And he partly obeyed God and he partly disobeyed God and thinking that God could split the difference. 
But God didn't split the difference, did he? This is a big deal. And I think as North American Christians, we tend to think that partial obedience is pretty good. But partial obedience is the same as complete disobedience, isn't it? If you offered a profane fire to the Lord like Aaron's sons did, what happened to them? Did they die? How fast? Immediately. And for Saul, he was the king of Israel. In chapter 10, 13, verses 10 to 12, it says, Just as Saul was finishing with the burnt offering, Samuel arrived. And Saul went out to meet him and welcomed him. But Samuel said, what is this you have done? And Saul replies, you know, he's like, I was scared, basically. He's like, I was afraid. I saw people scattering, and he felt that this was going to be a good idea. You know, if you feel something's a good idea, maybe you need to analyze it a little more carefully. Do we operate the same way that Saul does sometimes on the basis of feelings? You say, well, I'm not going to ever have enough money if I do this. I'm never going to find a partner if I hold to these standards. I'm never going to, you know, be successful if I do that. I'm never going to. And so we make excuses and we waffle because we lack faith in God. And our cowardice is shown because we're not strong enough to beat the enemies. Now, they may not be the Philistines. They may be something else. The Philistines, they were a real and present danger, but maybe you have a real and present danger in your life, and you're willing to consider other options as time goes on. But what does God actually find pleasing? When Saul makes his second huge error, and we'll talk about complete obedience in a second, we pick it up in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 22 to 23. We say, what is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. What? Worship, I don't worship idols. I don't do drugs and sleep around and steal money from people. And I'm not like those people. This is, you know, the way we think. I just gossiped a little bit or lied a little bit or, or, or just, you know, I didn't follow God's word completely okay, but, but it's no big deal, right? And what does Saul hear from Samuel? To obey is better than a sacrifice. What are some of the commands of God that we don't like to obey? The Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. How about we just say, thy will be done in my life as it is in heaven. Thy will be done in my life. Give me my day, this day, my daily bread. So not every desire and want that I put out in front of you, but my daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we what? Forgive those who trespass against us. Oh, do I have to forgive people? Well, what if I don't obey on any of those things? What if I don't trust God for my daily needs? What if I don't trust God with my finances and my money and I don't do what he tells me to do with it? And, and, and what, if, what if I hold everything for myself? because I need it? What if I hold everything for myself in my relationship? What if I hold everything for myself in my emotional, you know, protection? What if I don't forgive? What, what if I don't do these things? What, what's the big deal? To obey is better than a sacrifice. To obey God is hard. Sometimes it's extremely difficult. We may not physically face Philistines with soldiers and charioteers but we face our own version of it in our own lives and how we trust God when things get tough is what really matters at the end of the day and we can't say that we are above cowardice 
Because as soon as we rely on our own ability, we end up in the place where we start to justify partial obedience instead of complete obedience to God. But that's the good news, and this is where I want to end this morning, is courage resolves complete obedience. Samuel was very angry with Saul's disobedience, and he does the job that Saul should have done. And we often skip over these verses, especially in Sunday school class. But I'm going to read them for you here as the adults, because we need to see what God's command was. So pick it up in chapter 15. So zip along with me. And this isn't going to be on the overhead, so you've got to read it with me in the Bible. So get your Bibles out and read it. So Saul, what has Saul done? Saul has defeated the Amalekites. Is that, is that it okay, Dave? Amalekites? There you go. Amalekites. There you go. Thank you, Dave. All right. Dave's been correcting me on my pronunciation there. Uh, the Amalekites. And, and so here we read that Saul kept one of them alive, the king. And, and why would he have done that? To show his dominance over these people, to do what all the other kings were doing. They would keep the world leaders that they had captured, and they would keep them in their courts. It was a sign of their power and their influence and authority. But God had commanded them, God had commanded the Israelites to destroy the Amalekites. He had commanded them to destroy them. And this is what we read in verse 32. Then Samuel said, bring King Agag to me. And Agag arrived full of hope, for he thought, surely the worst is over and I've been spared. But Samuel said, as your sword has killed the sons of many mothers, now your mother will be childless. And Samuel cut Agag to pieces before the Lord at Gilgal. Whoa, that's nasty. Why would he do that? Because Israel, this is some of the things that are hard to read in the Old Testament, but Israel was God's instrument of justice in the world for the actions that nation states would make against each other in the area. In particular, attacking his own holy people. I want to read three verses, two from Exodus 17 and one from Deuteronomy 25 that gives you an idea of why this happened. So let's read. After the victory, this is in the Old Testament, this is during the time in the wilderness. After the victory against the Amalekites, the Lord instructed Moses, write this down on a scroll as a permanent reminder and read it aloud to Joshua. I will erase the memory of Amalek from under heaven. He said, they have raised their fist against the Lord's throne. So now the Lord will be at war with Amalek, with the Amalek generation after generation. And then verse 25, what did they do? They attacked you when you were exhausted and weary, and they struck down those who were straggling behind. They were picking off the women, children, and elderly, the easy targets, the soft targets. We try to clean up the messy parts of the Old Testament to justify partially obeying God's word ourselves. But this is nothing new. Even Saul struggled to obey. Are there hard parts of the Bible that you don't like? Anybody find anything in the Bible? You're like, I really don't like that. I really don't like that doctrine. I don't like that teaching. Maybe you even just read this and you go, I don't like that either. Who answers to who? Do we answer to God or do God answer to us? This is, this is the fundamental question we have to ask ourselves. If we put ourselves in a proper place, we realize God is God and he sets the standard and we just have to follow his command. And so thankfully, we don't live under the old covenant. We don't have to do the things that the nation of Israel had to do. We're not a military force. The church is a spiritual force. And we have a totally different take on how we interact with those who don't know Christ. We're not a soldier-led army with physical force, right? We're a spiritual-led army that fights a much even more important battle. But this was a difficult thing for Israel to do. It was a difficult thing for Saul to do. And he decided, I will mostly obey, but not completely obey. But when you completely obey, good things happen. Who was the last Amalekite that's recorded in the Bible? His name was Haman. You remember Haman during the time of Queen Esther? What did Haman try to do to the Jews? To kill how many of them? All of them. 
See, God's the God of history. And because they left one of them alive, because there are spiritual forces at play in this world that we don't see, folks. And because they didn't do what God commanded them to do, and they let people go that they shouldn't have let people go, it came back to almost wipe them off the face of the earth about a thousand years later. And in the same way, when we don't completely obey God, it dogs us as well. When we build, it looks good at the beginning. But what tests a house's worth and value? It's when it's tested, right? And what's the most important part of your house? The foundation is, right? So I want to end with these verses in Luke chapter 6. And this is about obeying God. These are the words of Jesus. Anyone who hears and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house right on the ground without a foundation. And when the floods sweep down against that house, it will collapse into a heap of ruins. How many of you have ever seen a house that was built on a bad foundation? You ever seen those things? Maybe it's somebody's cottage, you know, they just threw it up and they put a bunch of timbers and they threw it right down on top of the ground. What ends up happening in Canada if you throw a house right on top of the ground? What ends up happening? It ends up, eventually, it, it goes down, right? Anyone who hears God's word and doesn't obey it is like that person who builds a house without a foundation. Saul's foundation was shaky from the start. Oh yeah, he loved God perhaps at times. But he wasn't, he wasn't someone that held it deeply. As soon as tough times descended, he chose cowardice over courage. And we're no different. What lessons can we learn from the life of King Saul? We can learn the lessons that courage rests in God's authority over our lives. That courage is completed when we fully obey God. That courage is needed to live the life that Jesus has set before us. So I want to encourage us this morning to resolve to live a life with courage and boldness that demonstrates the power of faith in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray for us as we navigate this life. And Lord, we're not strong enough. We're not powerful enough. We're not... Um, strong enough to be able to withstand all the tests and trials and temptations and, and struggles that the world throws our way and that the devil even uh, tests us with. Father God, I thank you that you teach us that courage is something that comes from above, not from within. That we as the children of God need to trust you. And God, I want to ask that you would help me to set a good example in that regard. I thank you for teaching the lessons of weakness and of your goodness and your grace. Even this morning, teaching me that lesson again. And it's hard to do it in public. It's hard to be in front of others and see that happen. But God, you can use anything. Lord God, there may be some this morning who've been struggling with something and they needed to give it to you. I pray that they would find their rest in you, that they would find their strength in you that they would find their courage in you. Lord God, I pray that you would help us to resolve to trust the Lord and that you would be our strength no matter what comes. We thank you for Jesus. We pray that we live according to his strength in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's stand together. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, when everything around So why would he 
It's wonderful. It's beautiful outside. How many of you are going to go for a walk? Okay, come on. How many of you are actually going to go for a walk or do something outside, right? So let's enjoy God's weather, especially Winnipeg when you only get so many good weeks in the year. Let's do that. God bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and lift up his countenance upon us. And may the Lord bring us his peace. All God's people said, amen. Go in his grace. See ya. Well, Ed.